Hi everyone, I feel I see a few people have joined, but we're just going to give it another minute or so um, for people to continue to enter. Okay, so it looks like we've had a few people join. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Dana Rotz and I'm happy to welcome you to this session on recent improvements uh, to the WhatWorks Clearinghouse. Um, we have four presenters today. I'm up first and I'll be discussing uh, relevant and useful WhatWorks Clearinghouse systematic reviews in early childhood to grade 12 education. After that, I'll kick it over to Alan Porowski, who will present on finding everything that works, accessing and using WWC source data. After him, Josh uh, Palanin will present uh, on version 4.1 of the WWC Standards and Procedures Handbooks. And finally, Jonathan Jacobson from the US Department of Education will provide a discussion. So without further ado, let me go ahead and jump into our first presentation. So as I mentioned, I'm Dana Rotz. I'm a senior researcher at Mathematica and the deputy project director for the WWC's work to conduct systematic reviews of research in early childhood to grade 12 education. Today, I'll share with you a look under the hood of how the WWC conducts its systematic reviews and how the process is designed to result in products that are relevant and useful to decision makers. We'll use the launch of a recent intervention port report in a recently launched topic area for the WWC, school leadership, as an example, sharing the results of that review and how the intervention report is designed to make it easy for decision makers to find the information that they need. What we're Clearinghouse intervention reports distill findings from high quality research into meaningful conclusions about the effectiveness of educational programs, policies, practices, and products. The WWC Organization of Reporting of Evidence on Graduation Achievement and Non-Academic Outcomes, or WWC Oregano team, produces intervention reports in a variety of topic areas in early childhood, elementary, and secondary education. Selected recent and forthcoming reports include Passport Reading Journeys and ITSS in Literacy, Fraction Faceoff, FAS, and PBI Science in STEM, um, or Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, McRell Balance Leadership and EMINTS in the Educator Excellence and School Leadership topic area, and then word generation in the topic area on research for English learners. I also, apologies, forgot to mention at the beginning that participants can submit questions at any time during this presentation, um, and we'll dis we will um, discuss those questions at the end. Um, so we're all gonna present first, uh, and then we will turn to the questions, which you can submit through the um, GoToWebinar function. My apologies for forgetting that at the beginning. 
So back to the presentation, uh, sorry. The WWC uses a systematic review process to report on the evidence for an intervention summarized here in four steps. First, the WWC searches for all studies of the intervention's effectiveness. Then, using a review protocol describing which studies should be included in the review, WWC staff select the studies. Next, after that, the WWC Procedures and Standards Handbook and the protocol guide reviewers in reviewing eligible studies. And then finally, intervention reports summarize the strength of the evidence. For each topic area, a review protocol describing how the WWC will identify, review, and summarize the effectiveness research on interventions related to the topic area guides reviews. To ensure that intervention reports reflect content area expertise, each topic area team tailors protocols based on input from prominent experts in the field. Protocols include descriptions of what studies are eligible for review, how the WWC will search for those studies, how the studies will be reviewed once determined eligible, and which findings will contribute to the WWC's summary of an intervention's effectiveness for education decision makers. All review, to, re, all review protocols are posted to the WWC website for anyone to look at um, if they're interested. The WWC's ultimate goal is to support education decision makers, and protocols are designed to support practical and meaningful conclusions for these stakeholders. The choices WWC staff make in developing review protocols therefore reflect this. And it's really important to keep in mind that the WWC team would probably have made different decisions if they were conducting a review focused on an audience of researchers or intervention developers. Given our focus on educators, it's especially important for protocols to balance accessibility and technical accuracy and completeness. So what I mean there is that a protocol should be technically correct and needs to be technically correct, but we want it to still be understandable by a wide audience and in particular by educators. Today, we'll share new findings from the WWC's systematic review of a professional development program for school leaders. We'll use this new intervention report and topic area to demonstrate how the systematic review process leads to relevant and useful products. Research has shown that effective teachers and school leaders can substantially influence student outcomes, including student achievement, and this has led to the creation of programs designed to help teachers and school leaders improve out student outcomes. The WWC School Leadership Topic Area was launched to guide reviews of interventions aimed at making school leaders more effective at doing this and to help decision makers understand which of these interventions might be effective. Like all WWC protocols, the Teacher Excellent and School Leadership Protocols support the WWC in developing intervention reports with practical and meaningful conclusions on intervention effectiveness for education decision makers. A purpose statement spe uh, specifies the goals of the review and guiding research questions. That statement narrows the scope of the review to practical and relevant questions that decision makers need answered. For the school leadership topic area, those research questions are which interventions improve student achievement, progression in school, social emotional learning, and behavior, and which interventions improve retention and practice for teachers and school leaders. Literature search procedures are also described in protocols and describe how the team identifies relevant interventions selects interventions for review, and locates all publicly available research on the selected intervention's effectiveness. These procedures support developing useful and comprehensive products for decision makers. For the school leadership topic area, the protocol states that the team will identify all publicly available research, including both work published in research journals and work otherwise disseminated by research centers like the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders. Eligibility criteria, including eligible populations, eligible interventions, and eligible outcome measures, specify the findings that will contribute to summaries of an intervention's effectiveness. 
These criteria focus the review on the most meaningful and informative findings for decision makers. For populations in the school leadership uh, protocol, we take a relatively broad stance, including both current and pre-service student school leaders, which we define to include principals, assistant principals, and deans and students, deans of students, and students in early childhood to grade 12. This allows us to include all potentially relevant research on school leaders in early childhood through grade 12 settings. Similarly, a wide variety of interventions designed to improve school leadership are eligible for review, but we purposefully exclude interventions conducted primarily at the school, uh, at the student or classroom teacher level. For outcomes, we focus on measures of student achievement and measures linked to student achievement, like instructional practice or leader retention. This allows us to focus on the most meaningful outcomes, though it admittedly does omit some potentially interesting measures like student attitudes or beliefs. Special considerations in applying evidence standards in a protocol detail how reviewers should apply the WWC standards. These considerations include whether to be cautious or optimistic in assessing whether attrition can bias the findings from randomized controlled trials, and what key factors must be similar in the intervention and comparison groups before the intervention occurs for quasi-experimental design studies to provide plausibly valid findings. These considerations guide the WWC's reviews of research so that intervention reports can provide comprehensive summaries of the available high-quality evidence. Let's turn now from protocols, which guide reviews, to intervention reports, which summarize them. Intervention reports describe, in 15 pages or less, the intervention, what the WWC concluded about its effectiveness based on its review of the research, and how the WWC came to its conclusions. The first page of the intervention report includes details on the motivation for the intervention, the number of studies reviewed, and the number meeting WWC standards and a high-level summary of the WWC's findings about the intervention's effectiveness. Effectiveness ratings provide a bottom-line summary of how the intervention affects outcomes. The report explains what the ratings mean and how the WWC came to its conclusions about the intervention. So here's a summary table for the recent Balanced Leadership Intervention Report, along with the summary statement that um, at the bottom here, that implementing balanced leadership may increase school leader retention at the school. Breaking this table down, the first column shows the outcome or domain of focus. Each outcome or domain with at least some evidence, that is for, we, for which at least some study included a finding that met WWC design standards, is listed in this table. Here, that's school leader retention. Since we only had one outcome in the domain, we report the actual outcome, school leader retention at the school, instead of the domain name in the table. Note that the study also reported findings for other outcomes, but those findings did not meet standards. So we do not show those findings in this summary table. In the next column is the effectiveness rating, which considers the size and significance of findings across all studies. The WWC found that implementing balanced leadership had potentially positive effects on school leader retention at the school, which means that the intervention may improve retention, but that the evidence was too limited to make a stronger claim. I'll get into all the possible effectiveness ratings on the next slide. In the third and fourth columns here, we show the means for the outcome in the intervention and comparison groups. In this case, 76% of school leaders were retained in the intervention group compared with 60% in the comparison group. When it is sensible, as it is here, the WWC reports means by study group in natural units, like percent, instead of effect sizes or improvement indices. We believe these are more salient and easier to understand for educators. Effect sizes, improvement indices, and p-values are all reported later in the report. Finally, we summarize the evidence the WWC used to make conclusions about the outcomes in the final columns. Here, the finding was based on a single study that met WWC design standards, including 124 principles. 
We list the number of principals here instead of the number of students, which is typically listed, because the intervention was done at the principal level and the outcome was measured at the principal level. As I mentioned, the WWC assigns domains one of six effectiveness ratings, which take into account the number of studies meeting WWC design standards with and without reservations, and the sign, size, and precision or statistical significance of the different findings. These designations are meant to balance clarity and accessibility. The idea is to boil down complex rules about technical concepts into a brief statement that is broadly accessible. So for example, if we found positive effects, the statement is the intervention is likely to change an outcome. Based on evidence where there's strong evidence of a positive effect with no overriding contrary evidence. The idea is to boil down these complex rules into the brief statement. We continue to try to simplify these ratings. For example, in the most recent version of the WWC standards and procedures, the mixed effects rating has been eliminated. The intervention report also contains implementation and cost information to help decision makers understand what is needed to successfully implement the intervention. In the balanced leadership intervention report, this section described the key components of the balanced leadership program, including the framework for actions and behaviors of school leaders, the on-site professional learning for school leaders in both the first and second year of the intervention, and training available for district staff. Cost information is also provided in intervention reports, but cost is about more than just dollars. The new format of cost reporting in intervention reports identifies the facilities, staff, and other resources required to implement the intervention. We report this information when it's available because it's very important to decision makers. Unfortunately, it's not often available in the research we review. So here, for instance, for balanced leadership, we report the equipment and material costs required, the personnel costs, and the facilities costs. We also report on whether, the, whether or not the costs were paid by students and, or parents, any in-kind support available, and sources of funding. Finally, intervention reports include information about the context and populations that were included in the research summarized in the report. Knowing the characteristics of students, the types of schools, and where the studies were conducted can help decision makers understand whether the research occurred in settings similar to their own. We tailor the information reported in each intervention report based on the intervention of focus and the information available. For student level interventions, the information included generally is things like race and ethnicity, free and reduced price lunch status, special education status, gender, and grade. Here, for balanced leadership, we try to highlight key characteristics of both the school leaders who received the intervention and their students. So you'll see up at the top, we provide information on the setting. In this case, once we looked at one study conducted in 126 public schools in Northern uh, Michigan in rural districts. We report on student race and free and reduced price lunch status, as well as principal race and the share of principals with graduate degrees. At the bottom here, you can see that the grades that the, that the principal served, the school leaders served, um, ranged from kindergarten to grade 12. So most of what I've mentioned today is really relevant for our 15-page um, or at most 15-page full intervention report. But in addition to that main intervention report, the WWC also produces short summaries of the report, including a one-page snapshot and a four-page brief. These documents are designed to provide a quick reference with key information. So that's all I have today. Um, Again, you can please feel free to submit questions through the GoToWebinar, and we'll answer those at the end. Um, I'm Dana Rotz. Uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me or Elias Walsh or Jill Constantine, who are also members of the WWC Oregano team. And you can always submit questions to the WWC Help Desk. Okay, so I will send it over then to Alan, who's up next. Hi, Dana.
Thank you very much, Dana. And um, can, can you just uh, give me a, a voice uh, message? Can you see my screen right now? I just want to make sure. Yes, we can. Perfect, perfect. Great. Thanks, Dana. Uh, and hi, everybody. I'm Alan Porowski with APT Associates and lead methodologist of the What Works Clearinghouse Post-Secondary Contract, which is known as WWC Pepper. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Yuha Gu, from, also from APT and also a contributor to the uh, What Works Pepper contract. So in this presentation today, we wanted to share with you information about how to access the full range of the What Works Clearinghouse's tools and publications that report findings of systematic reviews. And we thought it would be of particular interest to three members uh, to show you how to access the source data for WWC reviews, uh, as these data can really open up a wide range of possibilities uh, for the analysis. So first, we're going to walk you through three different avenues by which you can access results of systematic reviews on the WhatWorks Clearinghouse website. So as you'll see, uh, the three avenues to access WhatWorks Clearinghouse uh, uh, products includes publications, uh, the Find What Works tool, and also data from individual studies. Uh, so the first avenue is publications. And there are two primary types of publications. Uh, there's intervention reports and practice guides. And as their name implies, intervention reports summarize findings from a systematic review focused in on a single intervention. Uh, practice guides, on the other hand, are designed to summarize evidence-based practice recommendations, which are developed by a nationally rec recognized panel of experts. Uh, as well as uh, researchers as well. So the panel interprets evidence from a systematic re review conducted by the What Works Clearinghouse, and then they provide specific recommendations, uh, including information about how to carry out the recommendations, potential obstacles to implementation, and also the panel's advice for overcoming those obstacles. So to date, the What Works Clearinghouse has developed 593 intervention reports and 24 practice guides. The Find What Works tool helps WWC users sift through all this evidence uh, produced for intervention reports. So it helps users shop, if you will, uh, for the intervention that best meets their needs. And this resource is really ideal for district level staff who are considering the purchase of an intervention or a curriculum. Uh, and it really allows the audience or the What Works Clearinghouse consumers to really compare effects of these interventions very easily and side by side. And I'll provide some uh, an overview in a minute of how, how these comparisons can be made. And finally, data from individual studies are available for, uh, on both the WWC website and as a downloadable file. Uh, so these data are really ideal for researchers uh, and grant writers who want to find evidence on a particular study. And we presume that the data from individual studies is going to be of particular interest to this three audience. Uh, and later in the presentation, we'll show you both how to access the data and share some affordances uh, of those data. So first, we will uh, review about, uh, provide you some information about how to access publications on the website. So given the fact that the, the entire world is pretty much uh, online at the moment, we thought we, it would probably be safer to show you static web pages. Um, but we do encourage you to uh, click through uh, if you have access to a screen right now uh, to follow along. Um, so the first step uh, to access intervention reports and practice guides is to go to the What Works Clearinghouse website, uh, which you can access by typing in uh, whatworks.ed.gov or ies.ed.gov forward slash NCEE forward slash WWC. And once you're there, just click on the menu button in the top center of the screen. Uh, once you do, uh, you'll see this menu bar pop down. Uh, and that will give you an option highlighted here to search publications. So this slide shows the core differences between intervention reports and practice guides. So first, these two products have a very different focus. Uh, intervention reports focus in on interpreting the evidence underlying the intervention, while practice guides focus in on how to deliver evidence-based practice. 
Second, the audiences for these two products differs a little bit. Uh, educators and administrators will both find these products helpful, uh, depending on what level of detail they're looking for. And researchers will tend to find intervention reports more helpful because they provide a much stronger focus on interpreting the evidence for a given intervention. So each of these products provides uh, really helpful information uh, for particular decision-making context. Intervention reports are much more helpful uh, for deciding whether to adopt a new intervention or comparing the effectiveness of different interventions. The web pages for the new intervention reports also include an ESSA evidence tag, which can be really helpful. Uh, practice guides, on the other hand, are really focused in on a grain size smaller than intervention reports. So they're really helpful for improving practice and identifying the best way to conduct a practice. So I like to think of practice guides as providing a roadmap to systemic change because the recommendations may be applicable to different levels within an organization, whereas the intervention reports provide a much deeper dive into a particular intervention. And then finally, it's helpful to know that when you're reviewing intervention reports, the intervention is generally well-defined and it's often manualized. Uh, practice guides, on the other hand, provide tools and information that can act you, allow you to act upon a recommendation in different ways. So next, we'll transition to the Find What Works tool. And we want to provide a brief introduction uh, to the Find What Works tool in case you haven't seen it yet. Uh, in this section, we'll demonstrate the affordances of this tool and the types of audiences that might be interested in it. Now, this Find What Works tool allows WWC consumers to search the results of systematic evidence reviews. And you can search by content area, uh, by grade, class type, school type, delivery method, program type, and outcomes. So even though the WWC currently has 593 intervention reports, this tool allows What Works Clearinghouse users to drill down the evidence with just a few clicks of the mouse. And findings are presented in the order of evidence of effectiveness. So you can quickly scan for the most effective interventions. And WWC users can also compare multiple inter interventions with this tool, uh, which is particularly helpful if you're shopping for a new intervention to take up. So this slide shows a sample uh, of output from a request to compare evidence uh, for programs designed for incoming freshmen, uh, and specifically college freshmen. Uh, so even though it's a little bit hard to read on this slide, uh, you can hopefully see that for each intervention in the column, uh, the Find What Works tool provides uh, the grades examined, uh, the program type, the delivery method, and also findings from a systematic evidence review for each outcome domain pertaining to the topic. So in order to make an informed assessment, Though, really, what works clearinghouse users should learn more about the context and the content of the interventions. We know context matters, uh, but this tool provides a really excellent jumping off point for making informed evidence based decisions. And the Find What Works tool also provides easy access to an intervention summary, as well as links to the intervention reports themselves. So now, we're going to move on and uh, to reviewing findings from individual studies. And unlike the Find What Works tool, uh, which was really focused in on systematic evidence reviews, What Works Clearinghouse users can use this feature to access research from individual studies. And this resource is really ideal for grant writers or researchers who may be looking for supporting evidence for a specific intervention. So. In this screen, we show how to access data from the individual studies online. Uh, so under the main menu, uh, click on Find Evidence, and then Reviews of Individual Studies. And altogether, you can see there's 10,656 10, studies uh, that can easily be filtered on one or more of the following. Uh, study design, uh, what works clearinghouse rating, uh, the topic area, the ESSA rating, or studies with at least one statistically significant finding. Now, the new intervention reports present main findings only, 
Uh, so this is also a very good place to go to in order to access supplemental findings. So instructional videos are available on this page. You can see them highlighted there at the top of the screen. Um, and they can, re can really help you navigate the search process. Now we're going to move on to accessing and downloading data from individual studies, uh, which we suspect is going to be of particular interest to this audience. So here's, here's where we can access the individual study source data. And again, just click the menu icon at the top of the screen uh, and then go to find evidence and then choose data from individual studies. And you can see it highlighted there in the red box. So once you click on that menu item, you're going to come to this page. And as you'll see, there are two download options. Uh, first, you can download a merged file, uh, which only includes data from studies that meet what works clearing out standards. And then second, you can download separate files uh, that include all source data. So you can see by downloading all the files, you just click on that that checkbox right there that's highlighted, and uh, you'll be good to go. Uh, so the merged file is ideal if you're interested in looking only at studies that meet what works clearing out standards. And this provides a very quick and easy way of downloading uh, a wealth of data. So if you choose the merged file, you'll find that it comes in three pieces. Uh, the first piece is a studies and findings file. And again, this is only for studies that meet what works clearing out standards. Uh, so this includes studies reviewed for the intervention reports, uh, single study reviews, grant competitions, uh, department funded evaluations, practice guides, and quick reviews. We also have a readme file here uh, that provides instructions on how to bring the CSV file into Excel. And the key is that when you're working with these data and importing the data into Excel, uh, make sure you specify UTF-8 Unicode text. Uh, that will remove the junk characters, I call them junk characters, uh, from the file. And if you're like me and oftentimes ignore readme files, uh, I can say for, for certainty, this is definitely one readme file that's worth reading. And then the third piece is this review dictionary, and that provides the variable name, uh, a description of the variable in the uh, data type. And this file also provides a reference to which individual file the data was pulled from. Uh, so for example, the intervention reports uh, file, the studies file, or the findings file. So if you choose to download individual files, uh, they'll require some merging, but uh, they provide most, most of the flexibility if you wanna get access to all of the What Works Clearing Out study data. Uh, including data on studies that do not meet what works clearing out standards. So linking these files is really simple. Uh, there's a number of key IDs that will allow users to merge the data in several ways. And just for example, you can um, aggregate findings by intervention. Uh, you can aggregate findings by topic or even across topics like beginning reading or adolescent literacy. Uh, you can also aggregate findings by study, uh, which is also prevent, presented in the individual studies um, file online. Uh, you can aggregate studies by intervention, or you can aggregate studies by product. So for example, a particular practice guide. So we're now going to transition to some descriptive examples of how the data can, from individual studies can be used. And we're going to use data specifically from the post-secondary topic area. So the data from the individual studies allows you to ask some really broad questions, uh, such as how strong is the research in post-secondary education? So keep in mind that the What Works Clearinghouse hasn't reviewed every study in existence yet, uh, but this provides a general sense of how rigorous studies are in a given field among the studies reviewed by the What Works Clearinghouse. So as you can see from the previous slide, um, a lower percentage of studies here meet What Works Clearinghouse standards without reservations in the post-secondary topic area compared to other topic areas. Uh, likewise, a higher percentage of post-secondary studies do not meet What Works Clearinghouse standards relative to other topics. 
So we can also identify common methodological pitfalls uh, that cause studies to receive it does not meet what works clearing us um, standards rating. So as you'll see here of the 243 post-secondary studies that do not meet what works clearing us standards, uh, we can see that the majority of these studies did not demonstrate baseline equivalence on the analytic sample. Uh, this is required for quasi-experimental designs and randomized control trials with compromised random assignment. 13% uh, of these studies that do not meet standards had a confound. Uh, the most common type of confound is an N of one confound where you just have one uh, study unit tied to a certain condition. Uh, or there's also time confounds are quite popular. Uh, this would be a situation where the intervention group is drawn from, let's say the current year, and the comparison group is drawn from a year before. Also, one study did not have eligible outcomes. And a lot of post-secondary studies draw upon administrative data, uh, which has assumed real reliability according to what works clearing out standards. So this study might have been uh, a research developed measure that did not demonstrate psychometric properties up to what works clearing out standards. Uh, or the study may have been collecting data on standardized assessment or administrative data in a way that wasn't consistently collected uh, between the treatment and comparison groups. Or it's also possible that the intervention may have been overlined, or the out outcome measure rather might have been overlined to the intervention. So we can also look within a topic area uh, to find out which topic has the highest average effect sizes, uh, which topics have the greatest variability in effects, and which topics have the highest proportion of statistically significant findings. Uh, so here you can see that studies in the transition to college uh, topic area have the highest average effect sizes, uh, and also the highest proportion of findings that are statistically significant. Uh, the greatest variance in findings is found in the developmental education topic area. So the upshot is that the individual study data can also provide an interesting big picture data uh, set of data to really set research agendas at a broad level. And then finally, we can use these data to see which post-secondary outcome domains have the highest average effect sizes. Uh, so this gives us a sense of where the needle is being moved uh, in most, most in post-secondary interventions, and also where it's not. So for example, we know the college graduation, which is covered in the uh, attainment domain in the first row above, uh, is a really tough bar to cross. But it's also clear that the Walworks Clearinghouse has reviewed a, a decent amount of positive evidence on strategies to increase graduation rates. We can also see that there's a lot of variance in effects for this measure. So this is a case where we know that there are some successful uh, types of interventions and it would be good to peel apart. Uh, what, are, what are the factors that separate the most successful from the less successful uh, strategies? So we want to encourage you to explore data from individual studies. Uh, it certainly provides a lot of affordances, uh, including, um, you know, it provides data on additional studies that you may not find in intervention reports and find what work in the find what works tool. Uh, it provides a much deeper information on reasons why studies did not meet what works clearing out standards, as well as some really interesting contextual variables. Uh, and the, it's also ideal for meta-analysis. Uh, it's good for cross-disciplinary synthesis and summarizing evidence at a broad level on a given topic. Uh, it can help you summarize trends and practices over time uh, and also down selecting intervention reports to take a look at. So this table is greatly simplified, but some, to summarize, Intervention reports are really ideal for identifying evidence on a single intervention. Uh, practice guides are ideal for identifying evidence-based practices and solutions to common implementation challenges. Uh, the Find What Works tool is ideal for comparing the effectiveness from interventions reviewed for, for intervention reports. The data from individual studies uh, on the What Works Clearinghouse website is ideal to find evidence to support an intervention model or even to refute it. 
Uh, and then downloading data from individual studies allows you to uh, conduct meta-analyses, cross-disciplinary syntheses, and a number of other activities. So I did want to just highlight one thing here, which is that the core audience column is not necessarily an exhaustive list. Uh, but we did want to show you that who would get the most out of each uh, data source. But this also underscores the point that the Waltworks Clearinghouse does package information in a, a number of ways uh, that are helpful for various audience types. So I want to thank you for listening today. And uh, sorry I missed you at three this year. Uh, but I found, hope you found this information informative. And I am going to turn it over to Josh Palanen for the next presentation. Hey Josh, you're on meet. There we go. Thanks, Alan. Uh, great way to start off the talk. Um, but just saying that uh, some great presentations to uh, start off this webinar. And um, if one of us uh, was going to be talking on mute, I'm glad it's me. Um, but welcome everybody to uh, uh, my my talk. Uh, What's new in version 4.1 of the WWC Standards and Procedures Handbook? Uh, like I said, my name is Josh Polan, and I'm a principal researcher at American Institutes for Research, and uh, the project director for the WWC uh, Statistics website and training contract, or what we call the SWAT contract. And today I'm going to talk about um updates that uh, the wwc recently published uh back in january uh, before i get into the updates though and the uh what's new and sort of talking through uh the advancements that we've made um i'd be remiss if i if i didn't mention uh, a number of folks who uh worked on the updates or instrumental um to the handbook updates um i've i've said this Often in other talks that uh, I've given that um, I uh, have the extreme pleasure of uh, presenting the information um, and representing uh, a great team. Um, we're led by uh, uh, a couple of uh, PIs, co-PIs, uh, Jeff Valentine and Larry Hedges, who both were instrumental in putting the handbooks together. Um, and then part, uh, we're also led by uh, one of the the project's deputy project director, Sarah Caverly. And then we have an excellent team um, who supports uh, the uh, the handbook updates. Uh, Elizabeth Nolan, uh, Ryan Williams, uh, Joe Taylor, uh, all co-authors on um, this presentation, but we have a, a host of additional uh, folks who um, help um, uh, make all these handbook updates, including uh, a uh, what we call the uh, STAT, uh, which is a group of uh, statistics and methodological experts um, who support uh, the WWC's uh, handbook updates. Um, and I won't mention all of them because there's too many to mention, but uh, in addition to those external folks, um, there's also uh, uh, colleagues uh, at uh, AFTA Mathematica who um, support that work as well. So a wide range of people have, have contributed to these updates um, and I just get to talk about them. So if you're looking for the, the new version 4.1 standards and procedures handbooks, um, you can go to this uh, URL here, or if you do a Google search for it, you'll find it pretty quickly. Um, uh, right at the release of the handbooks back in January, uh, we also produced uh, a webinar that uh, details the changes uh, that uh, Jeff Valentine and, and Joe Taylor 
uh, presented at, and um, you can find uh, that webinar along with a number of other resources, um, uh, Q&A and other documents um, at the WWC's new resources um, webpage, which you can find in this, in this link here. Okay, so uh, what are we going to talk through today and what are the major changes and updates to the, to the version 4.1 handbooks? Um, well, there's five major topics uh, to talk through. Uh, the first is the use now of the fixed effects meta-analysis for synthesizing effects across studies. Um, then we'll talk about how we'll use that fixed effects meta-analysis to synthesize across studies uh, as a new approach for um, implementing uh, intervention report effectiveness ratings. Um, then we'll switch uh, from the very broad to the narrow and talk about estimating effect sizes uh, when multiple effects uh, are present in a single domain. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, the WBC's new procedures for calculating effect sizes um, in single case designs. Um, and finally, there's a host of other changes that we've made um, that I'll talk through, um, some of them quite large and, and others uh, a little bit smaller. Those are the main topics though for today. So let's start off by talking about um, using fixed effects meta-analysis for synthesizing across studies. And uh, for those of you who uh, have uh, been involved with the WWC or know a little bit about the WWC's history, you know that uh, up until version 4.1, so from version one all the way up to, to version 4.0, 4.0, um, when there was a need to synthesize effect sizes across studies, uh, so uh, primarily in intervention reports, uh, the procedure used was an unweighted uh, meta-analytic average. Um, and so essentially every effect size uh, from all the studies included in that study were given the same weight. So small studies and large studies were weighted equally in that in that uh, average effect size. Um, so what this new approach has done uh, for version 4.1 has implemented what we call the fixed effects meta analysis, and what it does is it weights the average effect size or weights each effect size uh, by the inverse of the effect size's variance. Um, now the effect size's variance is essentially a function of the sample size. And what that does is it says uh, uh, everything being equal, effect sizes from larger studies uh, get a larger share of the weight, the relative weight um, in the meta-analytic model. So um, a study uh, from a, uh, uh, an effect size from a larger study uh, would have more weight in the meta-analytic model from an effect size from a smaller study, all right? This is a big, uh, this is a big advance for the WWC, and we think it it brings it up to uh, more on par with uh, what is considered a uh, uh, more technically sound approach and a, a much more um, state of the art approach. Um, but you might be wondering um, why the fixed effects meta analysis, and and for those who have done some synthesis work before um, or some meta analytic work before. Um, but why not the random effects uh, meta-analysis? Well, that was uh, certainly one thing that uh, we were interested in, in taking a look at and, and understanding a little bit more. And it really comes down to the size uh, of the syntheses themselves. So um, how many studies uh, the WWC plans to uh, synthesize in each model. And um, at the time, this was uh, some analysis we did um, Oh, a little over a year and a half ago now, so it might be a little bit outdated, but um, the, the point still stands. Uh, we looked to see how many studies were synthesized within each intervention report. Um, and it turns out quite a few of them uh, have uh, uh, zero or one studies within the intervention report, but even uh, a, a large share of them also have uh, just two uh, or three studies um, synthesized within the within each intervention report. And as a result of those small number of studies, um, uh, makes it really hard to estimate um, the random effect. Um, and as a result, we might get a, a poor estimate 
and we'd make too many, the WWC would make too many um, type one errors and or too many type two errors. Um, so with that in mind, we thought, well, um, it's not quite reasonable to uh, estimate a random effects meta-analysis, but uh, we still think it's reasonable to uh, weight studies uh, by the inverse of the variance. So let's let's go with the, the fixed effects meta-analysis. So that's the first big change, uh, first big substantive change uh, to talk about. The second one then sort of piggybacks off of uh, this meta-analytic approach um, to update the intervention report effectiveness rating. Um, and so, uh, in the past, uh, in versions 4.0, again, and, and prior, the intervention report effectiveness rating, so uh, the sort of qualitative uh, judgment or rating that is given to an intervention uh, within an intervention report, uh, was based off of essentially a version of vote counting. Um, so, how many studies uh, were synthesized in an intervention report? And then how many of those studies had uh, statistically significant findings? Um, so um, this is uh, uh, this is uh, seen as a bit of an issue, um, and we wanted to utilize um, the new fixed effects meta analytic model that that we had uh, just decided to use. So we switched from this vote counting approach to using the results of the fixed effects meta-analytic estimate as a basis for the intervention report effectiveness rating. So um, this is the old, uh, these bullets are the old uh, rating system. Let's switch over to this next slide and take a look at this new rating system. Um, and uh, no, I'm gonna stay right here for a second actually. So the, the in order to receive a positive rating uh, from, uh, uh, in an intervention report, a study must have its uh, at least two studies. Um, the fixed effects meta analytic average must be positive and statistically significant, and uh, at least 50% of the weight must come from um, studies that meet standards without reservations. All right. What follows that then uh, are the um, the, sub, the, the additional ratings for studies that don't meet the positive effects ratings. And so there's a couple different categories of those effectiveness ratings. Um, this next one uh, is um, uh, what we call uh, potentially positive effects, and it sort of follows along um, the same path as the positive effects rating does. Um, so now again, there must be two studies that meet standards. Um, the mean effect size from the fixed effects meta analytic model has to be statistically significant and positive. Um, and now, but but now 50% or less of the fixed, max, meta, fixed effects meta-analytic weight come from, can come from studies that uh, meet standards uh, without reservations. So that's sort of uh, for the version that has more than two studies. If uh, there's an intervention report that has only one study, um, then it's sort of automatically uh, docked down to potentially positive effects. But again, this study has to have a statistically significant um, positive effect. So we've got the positive rating, a step down from that, potentially positive effects. And then we've got this uh, new category, which we call uncertain effects. Um, and this replaces uh, two of the older um, uh, evidence categories, no discernible effects and mixed effects. And now in uncertain effects, uh, again, there's uh, at least two studies that uh, meet standards with or without reservations, but now the mean effect from a fixed effects meta-analytic model is not statistically significant. So that's one sort of version where there's two or more studies, or when there's only one study, uh, maybe there's a study that meets standards without reservations, but now this study um, no longer has a statistically significant um, effect size. So those intervention reports would be, uh, those outcomes of the intervention reports would be rated on certain effects. And then uh, from there, there are two more categories, uh, potentially negative effects and then negative effects as well. And those are just the opposite of the positive effects and potentially positive effects. Okay, I don't think I have a slide for those because those are just sort of repetitive. 
All right. So those are the first two categories. Uh, so those are the biggest sort of the broadest sweeping changes um, that we made. Um, and now we'll sort of dive into uh, the smaller changes, the ones that um, impact uh, really just uh, one uh, study or in some cases just one effect. Uh, but we'll start here by um, talking about estimating effect sizes and the effect sizes um, standard error um, when multiple effects are present in a single domain. So let's start though by talking about what I mean by, uh, what, I, what I mean conceptually by about uh, multiple effect sizes in a single domain. Start by reviewing what I mean by an outcome domain. So an outcome domain is a set of conceptually and empirically related outcome measures. So if you take the alphabetics domain, um, you might have um, the phenomic, uh, phenomic awareness or letter identification, both of those measurements might be in the alphabetics domain, um, or you might uh, have grade point average and standardized test scores within the academic achievement domain. So uh, if a study uh, uh, provided uh, outcome summary statistics and the WBC could calculate effect sizes uh, for uh, two effect sizes within a single domain, um, we'd have this multiple effects in a single domain problem. Um, now, in previous versions of the WWC's handbook, um, the way that was handled uh, was the standard error assumed um, that the measures were perfectly correlated. So that's what this uh, graph illustrates here, a correlation of 1.0. So um, we assumed that the standard errors of those two measures in a single domain were perfectly correlated. Well, so uh, when we assume that perfect correlation, um, it turns out that the standard errors are just too large, or they could be potentially too large. So um, uh, the WWC and the STAT investigated some different approaches to how to, uh, to understand um, that relationship and some trade-offs between this type one error rate and the statistical power um, of, the, of, of estimating um, an effect, uh, multiple effects in a single domain. And it, it turns out if we account for that correlation, um, if we assume that we can measure the correlation between the effects and we can go out, we can code it. Um, if we estimate that we actually get a, a little bit better power um, and we get some standard errors that, that, are, uh, that are reasonable and not too large. So what the WWC will do in, in version 4.1 is if the authors report the correlation between two effects, great, we will code it um, and we'll use that um, reported correlation to adjust the standard error. And if not, we will uh, uh, query the author to, um, to find those, those correlations between those, those two measures. Okay, and the last big change I want to make, I want to talk about is uh, the WWC is now calculating effect sizes for single case designs. So another uh, really large change. Um, so just a little bit of background here to start with. So there's there's been a number of methodological advances, like the slide says, um, to estimating effect sizes for single case designs. Um, and, Larry Hedges and James Pushievsky and, and the late Will Shadish uh, worked quite a bit um, uh, on developing these methods and have continued to develop and refine them. Um, and they coined the term uh, design comparable effect size, meaning that they uh, uh, found a way to estimate uh, an effect size that was comparable uh, to the standardized mean difference that we calculate uh, in the WWC. Um, so, uh, the first thing we did, we said was, okay, uh, it's great. We have this uh, DCS, Design Comparable Effect Size. What uh, current um, designs that the WBC reviews uh, uh, would that Design Comparable Effect Size apply to for single case designs? And it turns out that it applies to the treatment reversal design, the multiple baseline design, and the multiple probe design, so long as the sample size within each of those single case designs is three, three cases or more. So, okay, great, we've got a, a new DCES, we've got uh, designs that 
um, that are applicable and that the WWC already reviews. Uh, what do we need to sort of what do we need to put that uh, to make this uh, effect size, the design comparable effect size, uh, into place for the WWC? Um, so one of the first things we we need to do is say, well, okay, if we're calculating the design comparable effect size, uh, shouldn't it be reasonable to say that we can synthesize it with other uh, group design studies? And so we made we made that change, and then along the way we realized that uh, there was this rule, this 5320 rule, that said there had to be a specific number of, of uh, cases and studies and participants uh, within single case design uh, studies or across single case design studies in order for the SCDs to be synthesized. This was in the old version 4.1 approach. Uh, but now that we're um, calculating the DCES and synthesizing it with other group design studies, we figured that 5320 rule uh, was no longer applicable. So we eliminated that as well. So now it's as long as there's one um, single case design study that meets standards and we can calculate an effect size from it, uh, we'll go ahead and synthesize it with the other um, group design studies so, so long as uh, it's, it's reasonable to, to do so. So, okay, there's a couple of the things that we needed to change though in order to push the field and allow the WBC to calculate the effect size, the uh, design capital effect size. Um, and the, the biggest one was, in order to do so, we really needed um, the, the raw data in graphical or tabular form. Um, and so here's some of the, the, uh, uh, some of the formats, some of the things we need um, to, to estimate that DCES. Um, and here's just a little uh, a picture of exactly what we'd be looking for. And so long as we have either this graphical data or the tabular data, uh, we can go ahead and, and calculate the DCES. And actually, there's uh, right now on the uh, on the market is open and available. There is a uh, there is a web-based application uh, called the uh, the Between Case Standardized Mean Difference Estimator, the SCDHLM. Um, and uh, what it does is allows uh, the WWC to input this graphical data or this or excuse me this tabular data. Um, and based on the tabular data, it will go ahead and calculate um, the DCES uh, for you, and also its uh, and also its uh, standard error invariance as well. So that's a pretty big change and uh, allows for we think is a, a, a pretty great advance because uh, it allows again for the synthesis, the combination of uh, group design studies uh, along with single case design studies. And so uh, this is a big advance to uh, finding and synthesizing all available uh, evidence on a particular uh, educational program or topic. Okay, and last, I just want to run through very quickly for those interested um, some of the changes, uh, some of the additional changes that we made uh, to the WWC Standards and Procedures Handbook. Um, a couple big ones here just to start with. So we did remove uh, this, what we called the substantively important designation. Um, and, what the, and, and what this used to say was any effect that had an effect size of uh, 0.25 or standard deviations or lar larger uh, would have been deemed substantively important even if it was not statistically significant. Um, we, uh, the WWC felt like that 0.25 was somewhat of an arbitrary uh, cut off and um, and therefore we've uh, we've eliminated that substantively important language from the handbooks. Um, another big uh, change applied to the handbooks is we've estimated and written out um, all of the standard error formulas for all of the effect sizes uh, included in the WWC's uh, standards and procedures handbook. Um, there are quite a few of these. Um, and a number of them uh, that hadn't been documented um, in the past, um, including uh, what this figure shows here on the right, uh, the difference in difference effect size and its standard error. Um, so those are now all um, clearly articulated and clarified. A couple other things to the procedures uh, handbook. We've, uh, um, the WWC now has language that distinguishes the standards for excellence in education research or the SEER principles. Um, from other work of the WWC. Um, 
we've clarified language about the Every Student Succeeds Act or the ESSA uh, tiers of evidence, um, and we've aligned those, uh, like Alan mentioned, on the WWC uh, website. Uh, we've also um, implemented uh, new procedures for prioritizing interventions uh, for review, so which intervention reports um, get reviewed and, and published. And we've clarified that ERIC should be the initial source of studies for WWC reviews. Um, and we've clarified which databases to search uh, when conducting uh, WWC searches. Uh, a few other smaller changes. Master's theses are now available for, are now eligible for WWC review. They weren't in the past. Um, abstract screening now requires two trained WWC staff. Um, we've clarified author query procedures. Um, so that the WWC now queries for uh, what we call contextual information about the studies. Um, and this reflects some of the priorities um, and needs of the WWC to collect this information. And we've also clarified when studies uh, should be uh, re-reviewed or receive a new review um, uh, based on when they were reviewed previously by the WWC. Finally, a couple other changes to the standards handbook. Um, we've removed um, the, the pilot designation from the single case design standard, so now those are officially official. Um, we've provided some additional examples um, of, of uh, SCD compounds of, and what should be, what should and should not be rated, uh, does not meet WWC standards. We allowed for a little bit of greater flexibility uh, for missing baseline data, uh, for uncompromised RCTs, um, and we uh, added some additional language about joiners and um, their risk of bias. Okay. Uh, just to sum it all up again, um, if you're interested in uh, reviewing these uh, standards or procedures, um, this link at the, this URL at the top will take you right to the handbooks. And again, um, uh, if you're looking for additional handbook content, go to this the second uh, link. And the link at the top of the page, the resources page, just uh, recently, uh, that, which has recently gone live, um, you can find a host of content, um, both on the on the methodological side, but also on the substantive side um, as well. Here's a few references. Okay. And with that, uh, before we uh, attend to the q and A, I I believe, John, you are up. Thank you, Josh. And I can already hear you, so that's a good sign. That's good. I think I can actually make you the presenter, John, if you'd like me to do that. Good. Nope, oh, nope, you've got it. Thank you, Josh. So my name is John Jacobson. I am the team lead for the What Works Clearinghouse at the National Center for Education and Evaluation and Regional Assistance within the Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. I want to give some very brief remarks and then leave time to respond to at least some of the questions uh, that have been submitted during this webinar. And what I would like to emphasize is the WWC's uh, commitment to 
ongoing uh, improvement of um, our handbooks, our publications, and our online tools. So among our uh, handbooks, we have our standards handbooks for assessing our the studies that we review. We also have our procedures handbooks that describe how we identify studies for review and also describe how we synthesize findings. And Josh has described some of the improvements there. I want to emphasize that over the life of the Clearinghouse, which began in 2002, we have had six different handbooks. Our first handbook was released in 2008. Our most recent handbook was released January of this year, and we continue to work on handbooks. So if you extrapolate a bit, uh, you might expect another handbook in a few years, and indeed, that is our plan. We wish we could release a perfect handbook that would never need to be updated, but we learn from experience, and we also learn from the work of methodologists and the ongoing developments in the field, and these lead inevitably to improvements in our handbooks. In addition, we try to improve our publications. Although we depend critically on the work of researchers doing original research and methodologists informing how we assess and synthesize that research, we also have as our primary intended audiences decision makers in education who most likely are not researchers, but may be teachers, school administrators, program administrators, policy makers, parents, and others who can make choices that have the potential to improve student outcomes or other outcomes relevant uh, to education. So our intention there is to create publications and related products that are relevant and useful to inform those choices. And in addition to our major publications, such as our practice guides and our intervention reports, we also seek to make tools uh, available on our website. And these include tools for filtering through our study reviews or our publications, uh, different tools for displaying findings from studies or behind uh, intervention reports, and also tools for downloading and extracting relevant findings that then uh, researchers and others interested in those findings uh, can, can download and analyze themselves. So I simply want to emphasize that the improvements you've heard about today are part of an ongoing effort on the part of IES to improve the work of the WWC, to increase the quality of our work, but also to make it more relevant and useful to the needs of educators in the changing uh, situations that they face. So we welcome your questions, comments, and suggestions. And you can submit them to the What Works Clearinghouse help desk, which you can email at contact.wwc at ed.gov, or you can go to our website, whatworks.ed.gov, and submit questions, comments, or suggestions there. So at this point, I'll turn things back over to Josh so that we can respond to some of the questions that we have received. Thanks, John. Um, and I'll actually invite, uh, well, maybe I'll just invite one person at a time uh, to come up and, and answer these questions. Like John said, um, uh, feel free. We've got about another 15 minutes uh, before our session ends. So if you have additional questions, um, please, uh, please feel free to submit them. Um, the first, uh, the first two questions uh, are for Alan. So if you'd like to to jump back on, I can go ahead and start these questions. So the first one says, uh, um, you can search research reports by topic. Is this a set of keywords or a list of topics in a dictionary or a simple, um, simple text search? Uh, that is, uh, can I find a list of topics somewhere? Yes, there are uh, several ways, and I'll give you multiple answers to the same question. Uh, the first is that you can look at the Find What Works tool, which gives you, it's right on the What Works homepage, and it gives you a very good sense of what the general, not the official What Works topic areas, but it gives you a good sense of what the range of topics that the What Works Clearinghouse covers. 
Uh, if you're looking for a general sense of what the official topic areas are of the What Works Clearinghouse, you can look up under um, under the menu, you can search for protocols. Uh, and that will give you a full list of all the protocols that the What Works Clearinghouse uh, maintains currently. Uh, if you are looking for a specific piece of literature, uh, there's a general search uh, search bar at the top of the website. And if you're looking for a specific study within the search, you can go online, look at the uh, the individual studies uh, listing online. And one of the, there's a search bar right there too. Uh, so depending on what you're looking for, whether you're looking for additional, some general information about topics, it's right there on the website. Um, if you're looking for the official topic areas, uh, they're in the protocols. Uh, and then there's two search bars, uh, depending on where you are navigating the, uh, the website. So we have a main search bar and a, uh, a search bar within the studies database. That's great. Thanks, Alan. Uh, the next one, same for you. So regarding the downloadable data, you demonstrated looking at the reason studies did not meet standards. If a study yeah. didn't uh, meet standards for multiple reasons, uh, how is this coded, uh, presumably in the, in the data set? Yeah, great question. Um, so there is, uh, each study gets a single reason for a single disposition uh, for why it did not meet standards. Uh, <clears throat> the reasons for not meeting standards follow the protocol uh, that we, they basically follow the coding guide uh, reasons. And the coding guide, when we code a well works clearing a study, we're coding basically the broadest reasons for not meeting standards first, uh, and then down to the more fine-grained uh, application of the standards. So for instance, if you have a confound that tends to be answered first because that's more of a broad study level question. Um, if it's a question about baseline equivalence that that's further down in the protocol. Uh, so generally the reason for the study not meeting standards is gonna be the, the broadest reason uh, for not meeting. So uh, generally speaking, the confounds and the the data not being uh, not having an eligible measure or you know over alignment that would be up towards the top or one of the earlier uh, reasons. Baseline equivalence or high attrition without the demonstration of baseline equivalence that tends to be further down. So when when we showed you that slide that said most of the studies in post secondary were not meeting because because of baseline equivalence that generally signals that there was also no confounds in those in those studies. Uh, so, so that's, so it's basically a, it's basically a, a, a linkage or a, a cascade of different uh, standards being applied. Uh, and the most fatal flaws uh, do get answered first. That's really helpful, Alan. So for now you're you're off the hook. Uh, I'll turn it to uh, if uh, Dana or Elias are answering the next questions. Whoever is up is Dana again. Hi. Hi. The next question for you is how do you or how does one nominate a topic for an intervention report or for a practice guide? So for either of these, you can feel free to uh, reach out to the WWC Help Desk um, online. Um, I believe I provided the link in my presentation. If you go uh, back or um, you can, it's easy to see on the, the WWC website uh, where to find the Help Desk and you can make a recommendation um, through that portal. Great. One more question for you right now. Uh, will previously published intervention reports be updated to implement new processes, uh, such as a new, such as the new way of computing effect sizes uh, by downweighting smaller studies? Sure. So 
At the current point in time, I believe there's no plans to go through and do a wholesale update. However, we do consider uh, doing updates of um, intervention reports uh, to the extent that new information is available. So um, we include uh, interventions that already have reports, um, already have intervention reports associated with them um, in our process when we're trying to decide which intervention reports to draft. And there's a tricky thing here that we really try to kind of weigh the uh, the two factors that it can be good to go back and to update reports uh, given the new information, but it's also good um, to review additional uh, interventions and provide uh, new intervention reports on new interventions. Yeah, that's helpful information. Okay. Great, Dana. Thank you for now. These, um, and then there's two additional questions. Um, both of them uh, are for me, uh, but uh, if you're still on board for the last few minutes, and you've got a last lingering, lingering question, please feel free to, to type it into the question pane. Um, the first one asks, uh, or says that uh, we've dropped the mixed rating, but uh, how are mixed results uh, now reported so, for example, within a study, if students' reading assessment scores go up and their enjoyment of reading on a Liker scale goes down or between studies, for example, uh, four with positive results and two with uh, significant negative results. So this is a, a really good question, uh, also a complicated uh, question. Um, so it's important to um, remember that uh, so a couple different things here. Um, the uh, effectiveness rating is at the um, is at the outcome level. Um, so in that first in that first uh, question, if uh, there was a, a positive effect on uh, test scores but a negative effect on uh, enjoyment of reading, those would be uh, synthesized uh, most likely in different outcome domains. So. Um, you could have one outcome domain that has a positive effect, uh, but a different outcome domain that has a, uh, a potentially positive or a, an uncertain effect. Um, uh, and um, so that, that answers the first question. And the second question about uh, what happens if there are sort of mixed results between um, studies. So four significant, so four studies with significant and positive results, and a couple studies with negative results so the um uh, again we're take the uh the basis is is of the positive rating of the intervention effectiveness ratings is on the uh fixed effects meta analytic uh results um so if the uh fixed effects med meta analysis average effect says well there's a a, a positive and statistically significant effect that's the basis uh, for the effectiveness rating. Um, and so, that, again, it's sort of uh, different from the previous approach, which used a, a vote, vote counting approach. Um, but we feel that uh, using this uh, weighted average uh, provides additional nuance um, to, the, to, the, to the answer that we're interested in answering. Uh, and the other question uh, I have on here uh, for me, although I've seen a few other questions come in, um, is in practical terms, um, are we seeing single case designs where the case is a classroom or a school, or are they pretty much uh, limited to each case being an actual person? And uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, we have, the WWC has, uh, reviewed studies uh, where the case is a person. Um, so by and large, the vast majority, there may be one or two, uh, um, but uh, for the most part, we think that um, the SCD studies that we've reviewed so far are uh, limited to uh, cases being a person. Okay, and um, we did have one additional question 
let's come in and we have a couple more minutes. So uh, I'll ask Dana or Elias to uh, come back up and join us. Hello, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes okay, yes. great. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, briefly summarize the prior to uh, how we prioritize interventions for review. Great. Yeah. So uh, the the process is described. The process we've used is described in detail in the version 4.0 uh, procedures handbook. Um, it's actually not in the version 4.1 uh, procedures handbook uh, because the prioritization process is being revised uh, to improve uh, the, the process that we use to, to find interventions. But we, we look at a lot of factors. Um, uh, if you, uh, are you seeing my uh, web up? Okay, great, thank you. If you, if you are interested for more, I don't know that I have time to go into it in detail. One uh, excellent place to get um, information about this is on the standards page of the um, of the website, and under supplemental materials, uh, how does the WWC select interventions for review? And there is a uh, nice little infographic here, and I'll focus just for a minute on this graphic on the second page. Uh, so what we do is we ask content experts and we collect all the information we can about um, uh, the relevant uh, interventions in a given topic area. Uh, say we're looking for primary math interventions. We'll collect all, all, the, all the interventions, make a, make a big list, um, uh, and those come from a lot of different sources, including from the WWC Help Desk. So uh, by all means, if there's an intervention you'd like us to consider, uh, send, us, send the Help Desk an email. Um, then we'll look and do a search uh, for all of the uh, research available on each of those interventions uh, to uh, understand how much is out there. Um, uh, and then uh, we've assigned a score uh, based on the, the number of, of, of studies out there on that intervention and the quality of those studies, how likely they are essentially to, to meet standards, how many students are um, uh, included in those studies, how large they are. Um, and then based on that score, we'll, we'll uh, uh, review the, the top scoring interventions. So that's, that's the, the real quick version of the process. But as you can see, there's, there's more detail here um, to look at. That's great, Elias. Thanks for walking through that uh, neat infographic. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions, and we are just uh, one minute away from our scheduled uh, time to wrap this up. So, um, since I'm uh, the last one on here, I will. Uh, turn out the lights and uh, thank my co-presenters again, uh, Dana and Alan, John, and now Elias as well. Um, and thank you all for attending uh, this webinar. We will, uh, we are recording it and we're making it available um, on the, uh, the WWC uh, website. Uh, so look for that. And like you've heard a couple times, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to, to reach out to uh, the help desk. Uh, but with that, uh, thank you all and uh, thanks for attending and uh, have a great uh, Friday and uh, rest of the weekend and thanks for attending.